All right, it's five o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and um, get us started here. Uh, so my name is Madison Oman, and I'm with the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're very excited to have our second uh, webinar tonight on snakes. This is the second of our reptile webinar series. The first one was on alligators, and the next one is next week on lizards. Um, but tonight we have Tucker Stonecipher here. Uh, we met last summer when we both worked on Fort Bragg, um, and he is a great herpetologist. Um, so before I give him his intro, we are going, I'm going to go over just a few quick technology um, tidbits. So as you know, there's a lot of people on this call, so we're just going to make sure that everyone stays muted during the call. It's fine to leave your video camera on. But if the presentation starts to lag or anything, feel free to turn that off and it may, may help with the lagging. Um, if you have any questions during the program, you can type them here in the chat, which already has um, several messages in it. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in there and I will relay them to Tucker throughout the presentation. Um, when Tucker starts to share his screen, uh, you can make the presentation bigger by clicking the little thumbtack that's on um, his presentation screen. So it's on, if you hover over his presentation, there is like a bar that will have the, the microphone and a little thumbtack on the far left, and you can click that to make it pop up and be a bigger um, part of your screen. So uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and give Tucker his proper introduction. So Becker grew up in Georgia where he got his bachelor's degree in wildlife management and where he first got interested in herpetology. For three years, he worked mainly with Florida Fish and Wildlife on various herp-related projects. He is currently a master's student at UGA studying restoration and head starting to benefit Carolina gopher frogs, but tonight is he, he is here to talk to us about snakes in North Carolina. All right, Parker, you can go ahead and share your presentation whenever you're ready. All right. I appreciate appreciate it. Um, as as Madison said, I'm uh, I'm not from North Carolina. Um, I'm I'm from Georgia, and most of the work I've done has been been in Florida and Georgia. Um, but fortunately, there's a lot of overlap with with the snake species in in, in all three of those snake uh, those states. Um, there's uh, definitely better herpetologists than me out there um, and and you know, I try my best to to be as well versed on, on all of the herps in our area um, but there's always that local knowledge that you know I'm not going to have about North Carolina I can't tell you exactly which creek to find this snake at but I can tell you in general what type of habitat they're going to be in so um, are you able to see my screen Fantastic. Yes. All right. So before we get started, um, Tara, could you put out our little poll, please? So, yeah, so Tara, just launch, launch the poll, and you'll find it. Um, it'll pop up in the bottom right corner. So we just wanted to get a general idea of how people feel about snakes. Tara, were you able to see the results from the poll? Yes, I am. And it looks like the vast majority of people on here love snakes and some feel eh about snakes, but we don't have any who hate them who voted. So I don't know if folks are just a little afraid to share that or not, but it's good. Our group may be a little biased and that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so like I said, I understand some people may have varying backgrounds, um, may be really comfortable with snakes, may have handled many snakes and you may be meh about snakes. So I'm going to try my best to present at a level that, that's, that's, that's going to benefit everyone. Um, 
So as, as Madison said, um, I'm at UGA. I'm currently not doing research on snakes. I, I'm working with gopher frogs, but I've done quite a lot of work with snakes in the past. And with that, I'll start the presentation the best I can. <laughs> oh All right. So all about snakes. Um, there are 38 species in North Carolina. There's um, very few that uh, are in Georgia that are not in North Carolina. I think there's only, there's 41 species in Georgia. Um, it is pretty much the overlap was, was pretty good. There's out of 38 species, six are venomous. So we're gonna go into those in great detail. Snakes are highly misunderstood um, and it's okay. People have a natural fear of snakes. It's, it's probably instinctual. Um, and so we have to make a conscious decision um, to, to try and not be afraid of snakes. And, and that takes exactly what we're doing right here education and talking it out. Um, and snakes really play large, important ecological roles. Now, this talk is mostly going to be about snake ID. I could talk all day on general snake ecology, but I really wanted to expose y'all to every snake species that's in North Carolina. Now, General snake ecology, just to give you a, a background, they, they're vital predators um, that regulate populations of mice and frogs, rats, you know, all these small mammals and, and frogs and salamanders and, and other snakes and insects. Um, they're a really big part in that next trophic level or as we, you know, the, that next level in the food chain. Um, you know, we all we remember the food chain from, from school. You start off with plants, then you have an insect, and then you have a frog and snake, and then something like an owl. And snakes are really important at transferring that energy that's created at the bottom levels and then transferring that to the higher level predators. And the reason they're good at this is because snakes don't create their own heat right? They're ectothermic, which means that we as mammals, we waste a lot of energy just regulating our own temperature. So we're not very efficient at turning food into body mass. You know, it would take 20 pounds of food to make one pound of body mass for a person, but for a snake, they're much more efficient. And so they're a really good bridge at transferring that energy from the lower levels of the food chain to the higher levels. Um, just the presence of snakes can change behaviors of other animals in the ecosystem. That can be prey, obviously. It can be other potential predators. Um, and so these behaviors are um, really strong modifiers on the ecosystem. And scientists are discovering that more and more every day, that these non-lethal activities that predators um, create really drive the systems more than something as as much as like killing prey. So these 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 non these, these non deadly presences of a snake changes behaviors of all the prey and predators in the area. And they're found in various habitats. Uh, snakes are found everywhere in the world except uh, the poles, the Arctic and the Antarctic. Um, the, the biodiversity is, is, is crazy. There's like three or 4,000 snake species in the world. There's uh, about 120 in the U.S., and we have 38 in, in North Carolina. And just in general, reptile and amphibian diversity is huge in the southeast. We're, we're pretty spoiled. All right, so everybody wants to learn about venomous snakes, okay? Okay. Uh, it's, 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 you know, there's a lot of myths behind venomous snakes. There's a lot of biases behind venomous snakes. And, um, you know, I grew up with those biases. I'm sure as everyone else here did. 
Uh, like I said, there's six menace species in North Carolina. The five are hematoxic uh, slash mitotoxic, and one is neurotoxic. And all that means is five of the species, their venom attacks your bloodstream and attacks organs. And one species attacks your neurological system. And neurotoxins are very big um, in, you know, the Eastern Hemisphere and South South America. Um, we have very few neurotoxic snakes in North America, which kind of makes North America safer uh, on, the, on the spectrum. Um, there's some key identifying traits. So everyone's probably heard the triangle-shaped head, the elliptical pupil, um, and, and those are the first steps, but I would caution you to not just use those traits because venomous snakes can sometimes have round pupils, depending on the light. Non-venomous snakes will flatten their head out and make themselves look triangular on purpose to mimic other venomous snakes. So you can't just take one trait and say, ah, yeah, I remember the elliptical pupil or I remember triangle your head, that, that, that's, that's a rattlesnake. Um, you really need to take two or three traits of an animal and combine that together for your identification purposes. And unless you are 110% positive what a snake is, don't touch it, okay? Please just just don't touch it. If you're unless you're 110 percent sure you know what it is, um, and then there's this one caveat I like to tell people: there's no such thing as an aggressive snake. There's only defensive snakes, right? Snakes don't get anything out of being aggressive, right? They're much smaller than most of the predators on the landscape. They know that. Um, and so their first reaction to a threat is most of the time to, to hide. If not hide, then run away. And if they can't run away, then they stand their ground. Some snakes are much more defensive and will stand their ground more than others, but they're not going to come after you. Now, one thing that is a verifiable trait for most of the venomous snakes in North America is this 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 uh, heat pit? Unfortunately, you have to get pretty close to an animal to see if it has a heat pit on on the on the rostrum on the on the front of the snake's face, um, and that that is a legitimate way to identify a snake. But most of the time, if you're four or five feet away, you're not going to see a heat pit. All right, so here's here's a little bit of data on on venomous snakes in in North America. There's about eight. Uh, that's a typo. There's about 8,000 bites annually, of which only only five are fatal. Okay, very few fatalities occur in North America because of snake bites. A large part of that is because our snakes are not particularly deadly, um, and also because we have very good health care. Right, you can pretty much most hospitals will have some type of anti venom available. Most bites occur when people are trying to move the snake. Uh, or trying to kill the snake. And that happens a lot. People see a snake and they, they try to kill it. And really all they've done in the attempt to kill it is they've closed the distance between themselves and the snake. And they've actually increased their risk of getting bit as opposed to just leaving the snake still and letting go on his merry way and you're alive, he's alive, and everybody's happy. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of bites occur because of uh, alcohol. People under the influence of alcohol are, are much braver, um, and they're willing to play with a snake or try to kill a snake, um, and that, that usually results in someone getting bit. Um, of all the bites in North America, about 20% are, 20 25% are actually dry bites. And dry bites is where a venomous snake bites you, and no venom is actually injected. This can often happen when you're just walking on a trail, the snake doesn't even realize you're there, and you step on it or you spook it, and they buy out of reaction, and not necessarily as a predetermined act. 
And so a snake has glands, these venom glands, they have to mentally decide to pump that venom into their fangs. And so when you're agitating a snake, when you're poking it with a stick, when, you know, when you're messing with it, all you're doing is giving that snake more of a chance to pump more and more venom into its fangs than if it didn't feel threatened at all. Now, in the world of snakes, in the world of ecology, uh, venom is, is a highly complicated chemical, and it's very costly for an animal to make. Because of that, a snake doesn't want to waste its venom unless it has to, because it took a lot of energy, it took a lot of meals to create and maintain that venom in them. And so they only buy it as a last resort. Again, people get bit all the time, um, but most of them are, are because people are uh, playing the snake or trying to kill the snake. If you want to keep snakes out your yard, which is a question I get all the time, I have too many snakes in my yard, I don't like it. You know, I'm fine with snakes being out there in the wild, but I don't want them in my yard. Honestly, the best thing you can do is keep your yard clean. People tell me that, and I look at their yard, and there's boards laying all over the place. There's pieces of tin. There's logs and trash bags and stuff. There's big piles of shrubbery that they cut down from the past spring and just left it there. Um, and as a herpetologist, I see that, and that's just a gold mine for snakes. That's, that's where I would go to find snakes. Um, so the best thing to do is to keep your yard clean, keep it tidy, um, get rid of you know, unnecessary debris in your yard. Um, and, you know, the only reason why snakes are near your yard is because there's good habitat there or uh, maybe some free meals. All right, so there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of in the snake myths, uh, more than I could, I, I could put on this slide. Um, but these are some of the most common that pop up. Um, cottonmouths chase you. No, cottonmouths don't chase you. Um, they will feel threatened and they will try to get away. And sometimes their route of escape just so happens to be where you're standing. And so it looks like they're chasing you. I can argue with you all day that when you were 10 years old, you swear up and down that a cottonmouth chased you. And I'm just going to nod my head and be like, okay. Um, but they don't. They, they really don't. Um, they, they feel threatened, they're trying to get away, and sometimes you're just in that way. Snake repellents don't work. It's a sham. There's really no chemical out there that repels snakes. You can go to Lowe's and get your big old five pound bag of snake repellent. Uh, all you're doing is, is just poisoning other animals. Um, snake repellents do not work. Uh, snakes can bite underwater, including cotton mouths. Um, so when people go, oh, no, I was bit underwater, so it was a water snake, it's fine. You know, venomous snakes can't bite underwater. Nope, they, they can bite underwater, including venomous ones. Um, baby rattlesnakes, they, baby venomous snakes are not more venomous than their adults. People think that since these juvenile snakes are so young, they can't control the amount of venom. And that's true. They can't control the amount of venom, but they're also six inches long and there's not a lot of venom to control. So even though they can't control it, like they, they're really small, and they're not putting a lot of venom in you uh, as compared to an adult. Um, coral snakes don't have to chew on you to envenomate you. People think that coral snakes are rear fang venomous, and they have to chew on you to, to get that venom in there. That's not true. Um, they can just strike, and you can get envenomation just, uh, just from that. They prefer to chew to try and really get that venom in there, but it's not required. If you get bit, please don't suck the venom out. All that's going to do is cause you to lose your teeth and have gum rot. Because now you have venom in your mouth, which is a very permeable tissue. Um, and that venom is just going to go everywhere in your mouth. Don't do that. Don't, don't suck the venom out. Don't do the cross cut on your venom bite to make it bleed out. That doesn't do anything. Now you just have an infection. Um, 
the the best thing you can do if you get bit is get a set of car keys and go to the hospital. Um, if you got bit on a limb and mobilize that limb, the least amount that you move it, the least amount the venom circulates in your body, stay calm. If you're excited, your heart's pumping faster and your blood is spreading that venom more and more and more in your body. So the key part is to find a pair of car keys and get in the car, go to the hospital and stay calm. And in North America, you're going to be pretty good. You're going to be good to go. Um, not only rattlesnakes can make a rattling sound. That's one that, that blows most people's minds. We'll go over it. A lot of non-venomous snakes will shake their tail in the leaf litter to sound like a rattlesnake. And that's the whole point. They're trying to mimic the sound of a rattlesnake. And they'll move their tail, and it sounds really, really convincing. Um, so just because you hear that, that, that rustling doesn't necessarily mean it's a rattlesnake. Um, and it's not going to be nearly as loud either. And I could go on. I could go on with stink myths day in, day. So how can we change people's minds? Uh, oh, hey, oh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. We had a quick question. Is the venom myth the same for baby copperheads? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's um, so copperheads are the most common snake in North America for animations. Um, and the, the venom for copperheads and cottonmouths are are fairly are fairly weak compared to other famous snakes. I don't want to get bit by one. You're not going to have a great day. Um, but unless you already have really bad health issues, um, unless you get bit multiple times, it's generally not going to be deadly. I think so. Copperheads and cottonmouths are are, are very closely related. Um, in the history of North America, the United States, I think there's only been three fatalities from a cotton mouth. And I think one of those, like a seven year old kid. Um, but yeah, so their, their venom is, is generally weaker. I got any other questions? I'm going to rattle on. I got a lot of information. Nope, that's all good. You're good to go. Okay. All right. So, so how do we change people's minds about snakes? Um, what we're doing right now is like the first step, talking about it. Um, if you're not familiar with it, talk to someone that is. Um, there's something to be said about reptiles and amphibians because those are animals that we can directly interact with and not necessarily be in danger of hurting ourselves or hurting the animal. You go out and try to pet a raccoon, it's not going to go great. Okay? It's not going to go so well. Um, you try and catch a woodpecker with your bare hands or something. You can't, you can't pet a bird, but everyone's picked up a frog when they were a kid and looked at it and thought, man, this is really cool. Um, and it can, it can continue to be cool as an adult. Um, the, what I'm making my life uh, career out of. <laughs> um, and so that goes into, there's a hobby out there. There's a hobby called herping. Um, it's, like, um, it's full of a lot of really passionate people, um, but it's a great way to get out and enjoy nature and meet some really cool people and learn a lot about the, the diversity of species in your area. And you, you can live in, you know, I've lived in North Carolina for 60 years. I've seen everything there is. I guarantee you, you haven't. There are, there are species of snake that only come out in the spring at 72 degrees at night when it's misting. Unless you're out there, during that time, you're not ever going to see it. Um, and so reptiles and amphibians have a unique place where we can really look at these things and enjoy them and, and really appreciate the type of habitats and the diversity that they represent. These are all people I've worked with um, that, that are crazy about snakes just as much as I am. All right, let's, let's roll into it. Venomous snake ID. 
Before we get into that, there's two general things um, about scales that you need to know. There's smooth scales and there's keeled scales. Keeled just means that there's a central ridge on each scale. Don't ask me the reason. Their scientists don't know. Uh, there's a couple of speculations as to why uh, some have keeled scales and some don't. Uh, some people think that it helps regulate moisture on their skin. Some think it helps um, keeled scales might decrease the reflective light, and so therefore they're, they, they have a duller color. Um, but the, both ideas have, have, have huge holes in them. Um, but just take it at face value. There are smooth snakes and there are rough snakes, and they can help you to identify them. All, our, all of our uh, vipers, so rattlesnakes, cottonmouths, and copperheads, they all have killed scales. Here's the, here's the one everybody should be familiar with, copperhead. Um, copperhead is, is pretty ubiquitous in North Carolina. You see it's found all, all throughout. Um, they have these Hershey Kiss type um, brown shapes on the side. You see this uh, copperhead in the top left corner. Um, this is like a Hershey Kiss shape darker marking on the sides and that's that's ubiquitous across copperheads um like i said before never use just one trait okay because there's going to be copperheads out there that'll be just brown no markings whatsoever they're very rare but it happens um so it has pits you can see the pits it has that that vertical pupil it has the hershey kiss it has that alternating um, light brown to gray with a darker brown color. Um, and you might say, well, a lot of snakes look that way. And at face, you know, at, on the surface, they kind of do until you start learning the small tricks of the trade and how to tease these out. Copperhead is probably the most uh, falsely identified snake. Um, we have, or, or I guess the better way to say it is people say everything is a copperhead when it's not. People misidentify other snakes as copperheads all the time, and so a lot of snakes end up dead because people thought it was a copperhead. All right, the cousin to a copperhead is a cotton mouth, um, and a cotton mouth is called a cotton mouth because it has the white, very pristine white in its mouth, and it uses that as a, as a bluff. Um, to prevent, you know, a predator from, from you know, imposing on them. Uh, they will strike at you. They, most of the time, um, just stand their ground, and they will sit just like that with their mouth open, and that's it. They won't come at you. They'll lunge when you get within striking distance, but most of the time, they just sit there. I, I think you saw here, my boss in the bottom of the corner, he dipped the cotton mouth up. Um, and it's doing just what it always does. It's just sitting there with his mouth open saying, I will bite you. I'm going to bite you. Please don't hurt me. I'll bite you. And if you really mess with it, yeah, it's going to bite you. Um, so cotton mouths, you know, there's a lot of myths about cotton mouths. Uh, they'll jump out of trees at you in your boat. That's not true. They don't hang out in trees or shrubs. Um, they mostly eat fish uh, and frogs. You know, they're always near water. You know, I think everyone here is familiar with that. Um, they tend to um, bask during the middle of the day to, to, you know, to warm up. So that's how most people find them is, is basking on the side of banks. Um, you know, the average length is about three foot and a max max is about six foot. Um, and that, that, that's a, that's a huge, that, that, that's, that, that's a big cotton mouth. All right. So next is, oh man, let me, Uh, next is the timber rattlesnake. So these are all still kin. Timbers are still kin to cotton mouse and copperheads, but now we're getting to the rattlesnake range where they actually have a physical rattle on their tail. And timber rattlesnakes are 
they're declining across their range. Um, they're actually protected in West Virginia. Um, there's talks about protecting them in North Carolina and and uh, in Virginia as well. Um, they kind of live two different lives depending on what habitat they're in. So in South Georgia, they like to be around uh, sort of wet areas, um, so much to the point that they have a colloquial name called a cane break. And a cane break, a physical cane break is a type of habitat of, of giant maiden cane, which is North America's native uh, bamboo species. And it lives near wet areas. And timber rattlesnakes would love to go into cane breaks. And so people call it a timber rattlesnake a cane break um, because there's tons of rats and rabbits in there to eat. And so they would hang out in these cane break areas. And the term cane break has also um, become a common term for a certain morph. So a morph of a snake is just a, a color phase, a, 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 a physical um, attribute that makes it either lighter or darker, or it might have marks or it might not have marks. And that morph can be present in some areas and absent in other areas. And so a cane break is, is what we have here. Uh, the top left is likely you know, referred to as a cane break. Um, a timber rattlesnake has that brown line down the center of their back, okay, and they have chevron markings all across their body, okay. Uh, further north, so it might maybe in the in the mountains of North Carolina, like on the the northwestern side, you might start getting into very dark morphs, um, where they don't have this line on their back, and they can be very very black. And as the individual gets older, they can get darker and down darker. Um, mountain populations, uh, they, those are the ones that, uh, like I said, live two different lives. So mountain populations, they hibernate because um, it's cooler in the mountains. And so they will find dens. And you may have heard people talk about timber rattlesnake dens where timbers will find a, a good crevice in a rock and that's where, they'll, that's where they'll stay for the winter. Well, because mountains usually uh, are colder, there's a shorter growing season, there's less food, they grow much slower up there. And so in mountain populations, females may not be mature until they're eight years old, as opposed to like in the coastal plains or the southeastern part of North Carolina, a female may be mature in three, four years. Also, a mountain female, she may only reproduce every three or four years. So she's not reproducing every year. Um, reptiles, unlike mammals, their reproductive cycles depends on their energy reserves. They will only reproduce if they have enough energy. And if they don't, they'll skip a breeding year. Because of this, timber rattlesnakes are very susceptible to um, people killing and going to their dens and destroying dens. You can go to a population and kill 10 females, and you just knock that population back a decade. Um, because it really is those, those large females that are the breadwinners for a population. Um, are there some questions? Yeah, so... Uh, William is asking, can venomous snakes and non-venomous ones uh, den together in the winter? Yes, that yes, they can. Um, it depends on the species interaction. Uh, it's not typical, but I'm not going to say it never happens. Uh, the reason why is because a lot of non-venomous snakes are <laughs> actually predators of venomous snakes um, and vice versa so the, the you know I couldn't tell you exactly which species might do that um, but it could happen it could definitely happen awesome um, next question is are all snakes good swimmers when the need arises and um, which swim only with the head above the water okay uh, yeah 
pretty much every snake could swim. Um, they may not be as great at it as a cottonmouth, who's uh, very comfortable, but every snake can swim. Um, the head above the water, head below the water, uh, you know, that's another one of those. Sometimes it's a it's a rule of thumb, um, but it, it's not always correct. But but generally, people say that cotton mouse will swim with their head above the water, um, or you know, uh, more more out of the water than than a water snake will. Um, but that's not always the case. But that that is a rule of thumb. Awesome. Thanks. That is the last question so far. Okay. All right. So timber rattlesnakes, snakes, um, they're awesome. They're one of my favorite snakes. They're really, really cool. They're actually pretty docile. Um, you know, my, my girlfriend, she has, uh, she's a keeper, so she keeps reptiles and amphibians. She has a timber rattlesnake. Um, they're, they're really chill. Um, just, you know, if you antagonize it, it will, it will bite you. Um, timber rattlesnakes are used a lot in uh, snake handling churches. Um, and that's actually the, uh, in West Virginia, they're, they're an endangered species. And that's the only um, reason why households are still allowed to have a timber rattlesnake. So in West Virginia, there's a caveat to their law. Um, each household can have one male timber. And that's because there's a lot of snake handling churches up there. Um, so it, it, it's, a, it's commonly used in, in, that, in that culture. Um, all right, so next, the Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnake. This is a snake that, that I would say is, is a legitimate danger. Um, they are more likely uh, to strike than, than our other uh, venomous snakes. Out of all the, the, uh, all the deaths, of envenomations in the U.S., um, most of them are split between the eastern and the western diamondback. The eastern diamondback is the largest rattlesnake species in the world. Full stop. It's the largest rattlesnake species there is. Uh, they're very heavy bodied. Um, they can weigh like 12 pounds. Um, their average size is about four foot, and they max out at about eight. Um, you know, I've seen pictures of people with snakes on the end of a stick, and it makes it look like it's 12 feet long. Those aren't real. Um, it's just a, you know, an optical illusion. Uh, but they are very large snakes. Um, they are protected in North Carolina. As you can see, their range is pretty small. They prefer coastal plain habitat, uh, which is mostly in the, in the south southeastern portion of the state. So uh, diamondbacks are, are protected in North Carolina, which I found was really cool. Um, I wish they were protected in Georgia. Unfortunately, they're not, um, even though their numbers are, are going down at a pretty quick rate. Uh, most, of, most of the deaths are because of roads and people killing them, um, habitat destruction. Um, but there's a lot of roads in the southeast, and they just get, they just get hammered. Um, so a diamondback is pretty easy to identify. Uh, it's got diamonds on its back. Um, it has a really dark uh, band going diagonally from the eye down to its jaw. Um, that's something that's unique. Uh, you know, the diamonds will be bordered by lighter colored scales. Um, that's all relative. It could be yellow, it could be white, it could be just a, a lighter brown, but it's usually going to be a lighter color bordering the diamond. Now this this cute little guy is a pygmy rattlesnake. They max out at two and a half feet. That's that's the biggest one. Uh, average they're about a foot and a half. They're really really small. Um, I wish I had a picture of one in hand but not many people take a picture of a rattlesnake in hand. Um, but you can see in the top right corner uh, look at the the pine needles and give yourself a reference of how big that snake is. A, a newborn pygmy rattlesnake is about the size of a quarter. Um, they, they do have a rattle. Uh, they, they move it. Um, I can't hardly hear it. I have, I have really bad hearing loss, but I can't hardly hear a pygmy rattlesnake rattle 
It's very quiet. Um, I have handled quite a few pygmy rattlesnakes. Um, none of them have struck at me with an open mouth. They do what they call false strikes, where the mouth will stay closed and they'll just kind of they'll just bump it, bump it at you like over and over and over again. Um, but I've never seen one with its mouth open uh, with a strike. That being said, I've met people who have been bit by them. Uh, I've met uh, fellow herpetologists who are photographers, and they got too close while they were taking a shot with their camera and got bit in the finger by a pygmy rattlesnake. Um, that's on them. You know, they, they really wanted that shot. Um, but pygmy rattlesnakes are, are also um, colloquially named uh, ground rattlers. That's how I grew up calling them. My, my parents called them ground rattlers. Um, so you may hear that terminology. They can be very uh, variable in their range. South Carolina has extremely beautiful pygmy rattlesnakes. They'll be a uh, bright red, pink almost. Um, and you can see they'll have these uh, pink dots on the center of their back. Um, and you know that can be light brown or, uh, or red. Um, but the key way to identify these is their small body. They're usually dark with uh, the dark blotches on the back and then with alternating um, red, pink, or, or light brown spots in between. There are some questions. Yes. So um, are blue indigos still in the wild? Um, yeah, so eastern indigos, uh, they still exist in the wild. Uh, they're not in North Carolina. They don't exist in North Carolina. Um, I don't even think they're in South Carolina. Um, there are still some in Georgia. They've done some reintroductions in South Alabama. Um, they're still wild and native in Florida. They've also done some reintroduction projects in Florida. I got to help out with that last year. Um, they're, they're awesome snakes. They, they are really big. They're North America's largest snake. They get nine and a half foot long. Um, and uh, they're a keystone species. They're, they're really important for the habitat. And um, their, their population have declined like crazy the past 20, 30 years. Um, but, but they're still in the wild. And there's a lot of work being done to, to keep them in the wild. Awesome. Uh, do rattlesnakes and alligators compete for similar territory? Uh, no, not necessarily. Um, you know, they, they, they fill two very different niches in the ecosystem. Um, so they use the same areas, but they're not really competing, really competing for one another. Um, you know, cotton mouths, uh, you know, would obviously use the same area as the alligator, but they're not really competing for the same resources. Nice. Um, one which thing, NC, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, one thing I, I didn't talk about with rattlesnakes, um, they give live birth. They don't lay eggs. Um, Cottonmouths and copperheads and rattlesnakes, they don't lay, they don't lay eggs. All the vipers uh, do not lay eggs. They give live birth, which is, which is pretty cool. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, which NC snake is the neurotoxic one? This one right here. All right, great. <laughs> uh, one, one more question since we'll yep. talk about that one in just a second. Um, which species are most endangered now? I'm assuming that means in North Carolina. Uh, in North Carolina, that would be uh, the pine snake, um, the diamond, eastern diamondback, and uh, southern hognose. Those would be the, the most endangered. Um, and, and that's you know, southern hognose and pine snakes are also endangered in Georgia and Florida, along with the eastern indigo. And awesome. actually, this snake as well, the uh, eastern coral snake is a state endangered snake. Uh, that was a surprise to me. I didn't know that. Um, I, I guess it's because their range is so small in the state um, and they prefer... Very. This is a sorry. This is a this is an eastern coral snake, or some people will call it the harlequin coral snake. Um, they prefer uh, sandy type soil because they burrow a lot. 
so they need loose soil and as you can see it in the range map um that's the that area of the state is sandier um, which allows for their burrowing activity um so they're state endangered which was which was a huge surprise to me that was, that was crazy um apparently they're they're fairly rare um in the state they average about two foot um but they can reach four feet that that would be a massive massive coral snake it was four feet long um as most people know they eat other snakes that's what they that's what they specialize in um and i'm sure as soon as you saw this picture you were trying to say that rhyme in your head you're like does red touch black and does it kill jack or does, does red and yellow kill a fellow i can't forget the rhyme stop don't do it uh because that rhyme only works east of the Mississippi River. If you go west or if you go south, it doesn't work anymore. Um, and you can get bit and die. Uh, <laughs> but the best way, and so here's the three species that most people uh, get this mixed up with. So on the top left, you have the scarlet king snake. In the right, you have the scarlet snake. And then you have the eastern coral snake. And, and the rhyme does does work here. Um, if red touches black, it's a friend of Jack. If red touches yellow, it could kill a fellow. Um, but it's hard to remember that, especially in the moment. And so I'm going to give you a trick to identify these without any type of rhyme. Look at their heads. Look at the very tip of the head. The coral snake is the only one here where the very first color on its snout is black. The other two, the very first color is red. And so you can think of like black equals death or some type of moniker like that. Um, but that's the, be that's the best way. Um, and after you've seen enough of these, you don't even use that anymore. Um, you just A lot of times you can get good enough that you just... You, you get the just stalk. Just stalk means you can just tail because the way it is. Uh, you just get a knack for it sometimes. Um, I'm going to go into detail about how to identify a scarlet king snake versus a scarlet snake um, later on. But that's the key. Look at the head. Look at the tip of the head. If the color is black, it's a coral snake. If the color is red, it's not. And these are neurotoxic, which means that when they bite you, it attacks your your uh your nervous system um it it's these are the most deadly snakes in north america meaning if they bite you uh the venom is very deadly um and the venom is not found in a lot of hospitals the anti-venom is not found in a lot of hospitals actually um if you get bit by a diamondback if you get bit by a coral snake i mean a, i mean a cottonmouth or a copperhead you're going to get the same anti-venom um, it's called Crofab. Uh, those are all treated the same way. Um, if you get bit by a coral snake, they'll give you a coral snake-specific antivenom. And, you know, if you live in a small town like I did, uh, they ain't going to have antivenom for a coral snake there. Um, you know, they're going to have to get on a helicopter to go so, to a bigger city. Um, <clears throat> but, yeah, uh, neurotoxic happens very quickly. Um, and most people that die, uh, it comes from uh, asphyxiation. Basically, you, you stop being able to breathe, inhale, and exhale. You can't regulate that anymore, and you basically suffocate. All right, any questions before we go on? Looks like there's a lot. Yeah, let's see. Um, Will there be a boss snake in an area that keeps other snakes out? In other words, do they keep a keep a territory, or maybe does that depend on the species? Most snakes do have a territory, um, and you know, within a species, they usually respect each other's territory. Um, there are definitely uh, king snakes and like eastern indigos, which will eat any snake they come across. So. Um, I can imagine that if other snakes smelt their scent, they would stay away. Um, but no, not necessarily. There's not like a real hierarchy of, of snakes. Um, but you know, they, 
they will have their territories. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's all the questions we have for now. Okay. All right. Water snakes. Um, this is the plain belly water snake. Uh, it's fairly unmarked. It has a bright orange or yellow belly. Uh, sometimes it's called the yellow belly water snake. Um, you know, they are found in various aquatic systems, mostly uh, larger ponds, not necessarily running water. They, they seem to prefer still water for the most part. Uh, oftentimes you find them with short little tails because their tails break off. Um, most snakes, their tails don't break off, but water snakes do. Um, and they don't grow them back. They're not lizards. Uh, they can't grow their tails back like a lizard does. So you find a lot of water snakes with these stubby little tails because um, they bust off. Um, they uh, <laughs> look a lot like a cotton mouth. I'm, I'm sure someone may, may uh, mistake one. I'm going to go into detail in that at the end of the water snake presentation. Um, but the key to look at for all water snakes is that face. Look at the lips. Look at how each scale on the lip is bordered by a black line, a vertical black line around each lip scale. We call them labial scales. Um, there's a black line, a black vertical line on the border of each one of those scales. That's important. Uh, they have uh, keeled scales. They're very strongly keeled. You can see that snake in the top left looks rough. You would call that a rough-looking snake. Um, they have very large eyes because they're visual hunters. Um, and they, uh, whenever, whenever you grab them, these will bite you. Water snakes will bite you and bite you again. They'll they will bite until they get tired of biting you. Um, it doesn't necessarily hurt. It, it kind of feels like um, you ever had a cat sit on your lap and kind of kind of knead with its uh, with its claws. It, it's uncomfortable. You don't want to sit there and take it, uh, but it doesn't necessarily hurt. Um, that that's what they feel like. Um, but you will bleed a lot, and that's because water snakes have a natural blood thinner in their saliva. And so when you get bit, even though it's just a paper cut, you're going to bleed and bleed like you've never bled before. It's just going to keep bleeding. And then you're like, man, I'm, it bit my hand off. And you look and like, this is this tiny little scratch. There's just a ton of blood coming out. Um, and that, that's for all water snakes. They also will musk on you, which means they just, they basically, uh, they poop. They poop on you, and it stinks really, really bad. Uh, that's part of their defense is they bite, and they, they poop on their, their enemies. That's what they do, and it's very effective. Uh, this is the banded water snake, and some people call it the southern water snake. Um, it's pretty common in its range. They prefer you know, either moving water or steel water. They can use both. They're mostly found in North Carolina in the coastal plain, um, but mostly in marshes and ponds, um, you know, open, open areas. They're about two and a half foot and they can max out at five feet. Um, the best way to identify these is the alternating bands, red bands on their body. Um, but at the same time, as a snake gets older, and this goes for most snake species, they generally get darker on the whole body. So those markings can kind of go away. But if you look at the snake in the top right, if you look at his belly, you see how there's alternating red scales that just peek out on the side. You know, not just belly scales, but they're kind of, kind of on the edge too, kind of side scales. That alternating red will always be there. Regardless of what the top of the body looks like, that alternating red is always going to be there. And that's, that's the banded water snake. This is the brown water snake. Okay. Um, they're fairly large bodied. They're three and a half to five and a half feet long. They prefer uh, larger rivers 
um, and streams. And that's because they almost exclusively eat catfish. They love eating catfish to the point that um, <laughs> there's there's actually a couple of photos that's went around recently of these snakes that have eaten a catfish and the catfish poked its spines out and the spines were sticking out of the snake's side. And the snake is perfectly fine. The, those, those spines will actually, they'll, they'll rot off and the snake will heal and go about their merry way. Um, again, if you handle these, they will bite you. They will poop on you. Um, they are, they are very defensive. <laughs> um, but they can be a lot of fun to catch. I love catching water snakes. Um, the way you identify a, a brown water snake is that it has alternating blotches down the whole length of the body. And that's a key, key part of this. The whole length of the body has alternating blotches. You see how the, the top blotch on the, you know, on the dorsal side, the top side of the snake, and then the side of the snake, the blotches are alternating. They're not in line with one another. That occurs throughout the whole length of the body. There's another snake, the northern water snake, which looks very similar. But that alternating blotch doesn't start until about a third down the body. So if you look back here, that whole body is covered in blotches. But that top left one, the first third is actually bands. And so it doesn't turn to alternating blotches until about a third of the way down the snake. Uh, you can kind of see, look at, look at the range map, just look at the pure range map. Look at the brown water snake. Look at the, wa look at the northern water snake. And this happens a lot in, in predators where they will feel different areas in the environment. Um, they would still overlap, I and mean, they, they still do overlap. Uh, these don't necessarily prefer large rivers as much, um, but they, they will use them. You will find them there. They, they used to, they, you'll see them at, at uh, boat ramps pretty often. All right. Okay. Who thinks they know what the snake in the bottom left-hand corner is? Feel free to type it in the chat with your guess. All right, most of you said cotton mouth, and most of you are wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, that, 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 that's, that's, a, that's a banded water snake. Um, and remember I told you earlier that they will spread their head to look like a cotton mouth. They will spread their head to look like a triangular head, to, to look larger. But if you look at the lips, remember, cottonmouth on the top left, water snake on the, on the top right, that the scales have that black marking vertically on water snakes. A cottonmouth has that brown band horizontally across the eye. Even in that snake on the bottom left-hand corner, you can see, even if you can't see its lips, you can tell it doesn't have a big horizontal blotch on the eye. But if you look closely, you can see that the, the lips have black markings. You think that this is going to be hard to see in the wild, but it's if you if you get that eye for it, it's instant. You can instantly see. You can be ten feet away and and see the, the color on the lips. You think you think you won't be able to, but you actually can. It's it's, it's fairly easy after you get an eye for it. All right. Okay, so we got done with water snakes. Oh, and again, I forgot this again. Uh, water snakes are also uh, live bearers. They, they, they give birth um, to live young. Um, I know I said that's not common, and here I am saying back to back that these two different groups have it, but it's not common. It just so happens they both, they both can do it. All right, 
there's there's quite a number of king snakes in in North Carolina. Um, there's the eastern king snake everybody's rec- probably has seen before. Um, they have this chain link type pattern. Um, think of a chain link fence. That's how you'll see the the white or lighter markings on the body. They're fairly large snakes. They they get up to about uh, seven foot long. Average is about three and a half. They can get about seven foot. They eat other snakes. Um, that's why they're called king snakes. They eat other snakes. They specialize and prefer to eat other snakes. Um, the uh, I read this. Um, I was looking up about king snakes in North Carolina. The outer banks. Um, where's the outer banks at, Madison? That's that group of islands that's like right there off the coast. Um, kind of forms like a little triangle of islands off the coast. Okay, I see it. Okay. I read that the outer bank individuals are actually brown. They're not black. Um, they'll be they'll be really light brown. And uh, the western that the mountain individuals, the lines will be broken up to the point that it'll actually look like uh, speckling, It'll like small white spots. Um, so that's some of that variation, and, and that's why I keep telling you, um, don't just use one, one identifying trait, because depending on where you're at, it can look very different. So these are very large body snakes. Um, they use various habitats, but preferably near water, um, a lot of their prey hangs out near water. So if you think about water snakes, they'll eat a water snake. They'll eat cotton mouse. Um, there's a water, uh, areas of water usually has high productivity of prey. I get the, the milk snake. Uh, milk snakes are actually only in northern Georgia. I've, I've only seen a few milk snakes. They're very common. Um, I just haven't really been in the areas where they are common. Um, you they 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 can look like a copperhead, and most people um, misidentify these as copperheads. But if you remember, copperheads don't have a black border around their blotches. This snake, each of those blotches, these brown blotches, has a black border around it. Um, king snakes in general don't have uh, very distinct uh, necks, I guess you could say. Uh, I, I guess you could argue a, an entire snake's body is, is a giant neck. Um, but when I say that, there's not, it's not really distinguishable um, between the width of the head and the width of the body. Um, it, that, that's one of those things that you just, you just look at it and, um, you know, it's kind of hard to show that in a picture, but when you have one, you'll notice that like th- there's not really a big difference in width between body and head, and that's kind of uh, that that that's common in king snakes. Um, Tucker, we have a question just really quick. Yeah, um, go, go, go ahead. Do they have the same preference for eggs that rat snakes do? Uh, no, 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 not not necessarily. Um, not this king snake. I will get to another king snake. That's different. Um, they will eat eggs, um, but they don't necessarily seek them out. Um, not like a rat snake does. Rat snakes and corn snakes love eating eggs. Um, these are more active hunters, um, hunting other snakes. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, and will most snakes move during times of drought? It depends on the snake. Um, but a lot of snakes will actually move during humid times of the day uh, or humid times of the year. Um, people think that snakes are sitting out on a rock all day trying to heat up. Snakes get hot just like everybody else does. Um, and actually, they can get hot much quicker because they can't regulate their temperatures. Um, but, yeah, during drought areas, oftentimes during drought periods, they will, they will migrate to wetter areas. Um, just because it's cooler, and it'll be um, more. There's more product, like there's more prey production going on in wet areas. All the frog production and small snakes and fish. Um, 
that's why wetlands are really, really important. Um, that's what I'm studying, actually, at, at UGF. I'm studying wetland ecology because it is so important, uh, a factory of food for a lot of these, these animals. Awesome. Thanks, Tucker. And I just want to let you know it's around six ten. So um, just so you can keep an eye on the on the time. Oh my gosh. Oh man, sorry guys. I I, uh, <laughs> I did not realize how much time it went by. Um, I'm gonna That's go through. Right. Some we're learning. Time. We're learning so much. Okay. All right. I, I, I'm gonna I'm go a little bit faster. I'm sorry. I, I I'm just really passionate about snakes. Uh, this is a mole king snake. Um, they're not very common where I live, but they're, they are more common where you're at. Uh, they're called a mole king snake because they, they dig in the ground a lot. And they, they live most of their lives underground. Um, they can kind of look like a corn snake, if you're familiar with what a corn snake looks like, except um, king snakes, uh, just like most snakes, are, are tubular. So if you did a cross section of a snake, of a king snake, that it would be a tube. Um, if you did a cross section of a rat snake, it would look more like a loaf of bread, where they have a flat bottom and they have walls, and then the top of the body is is curved. Um, but mole king snakes, they they're, they're very uh, they're not rare uh, in North Carolina, but they're very secretive. Just because you don't see something doesn't mean it's rare. Uh, they just may never come out the ground. Um, and the difference between this and milk snake is look at the blotches again. Milk snake has uh, black borders. Uh, mole, mole king snake does not have a black border around its blotches. Scarlet king snake, I mentioned this earlier. The key difference between a scarlet king snake and a scarlet snake is that the color bands, so that red, black, and yellow, continues onto the belly. You'll see in a bit that scarlet snakes, that coloration does not continue. Scarlet snakes will have a white belly. Um, and so scarlet king snakes, they're fairly small. They're like a foot and a half, two and a half feet long. Um, they primarily um, eat lizards. They, they prefer lizards more than anything else. Um, and they, you'll find them a lot under shags of, of bark, either on logs or standing trees. Um, especially during fall. So if you went out herping right now and you pulled some bark panels off of a tree, that's how you would look for scarlet king snakes. Other upland snakes, I'm going to blow through these guys. I'm sorry, I spent a lot of time on venomous snakes. <laughs> uh, this is the eastern pine snake. Um, some people will call it a bull snake, and that's because there are western species that is kin to this called a bull snake. Um, and so if someone moves here from out west, they'll call these a bull snake. They're very large body. They are four and a half to seven and a half feet long. The individuals on the bottom right-hand corner, those are freshly hatched. Those are two days old. They are the largest hatchling snakes in North America. So they're the, they're the largest young snakes in North America. They can be hashed out like a foot and a half long. They're huge. Uh, they're very muscular. They're very strong. They actually don't constrict their prey because they're so strong. Um, most of the time, they just grab it and crunch it. Um, they, they go around into burrows for like mice and pocket gophers, and what they'll do is um, – like if this, like if a mouse is in the burrow, the snake will go beside the mouse and actually just swell its body up and, sh and like crush the mouse against the wall of the tunnel, and that's how it kills it. Um, they hiss really loud, and their whole body shakes. It's a very, very intimidating display. It's very impressive. It's really loud. Um, I've never been bit by one. I've handled quite a few of them, um, but I would not want to get bit. <laughs> They're not venomous, uh, but they got a strong mouth to kill some of the things they eat. Um, they are state endangered. So if you, if you see one of these, please, God, please don't kill it. They are very rare um, and, and not doing so hot. I love pine snakes. That's a garter snake, um, you know, a snake that most people will see 
throughout their you know time in the woods. Uh, quickly, quickly, there's a ribbon snake and there's a garter snake. They look very similar, and that's because they're kin to each other. Garter snakes are, are bulkier, they're thicker bodied. Ribbon snakes are very thin. Garter snakes have Stop it. black markings on the on the lip scales. So look at those lip scales, they have the black markings on it going vertical. They have vertical black markings. Ribbon snakes don't have that. Um, both of them are fairly loving towards water. Uh, ribbon snakes more than garter snakes. Um, they, you know, garter snakes have that checkerboard pattern. So both snakes have stripes going down their bodies, but but garter snakes have that checkerboard pattern on the sides between between the lines. I don't know why ribbon snakes are not on that western portion of the state. Is that where it's more mountainous? Yeah, that's right. Is it more mountainous over there? Yeah, they, they, they probably yeah they probably don't like yeah. I've never I've never seen a ribbon snake in the mountains. All right, this is a black racer or eastern racer, whatever you want to call it. Um, very common snake that people misidentify as uh, indigos. Um, Y'all don't have to worry about that. You're in North Carolina. You don't have indigos, um, but black racers are.